Okay, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Hans, and our Turkish uh, hosts for having me and having us here. Great pleasure um, and honor for uh, We have to talk about corruption this morning, and um, the, the way I want to present it to you is twofold, actually. I'm going to divide my presentation into two, two sections. The first section is very quick and a little boring, I ask for forgiveness. Um, it's uh, about definitions. Then I'll go quickly into the literature, and then perhaps the most exciting side is going to be what can we do, what can we learn, and what can we propose uh, in order to have uh, I wouldn't say a new vision, but a new way to look at the data and uh, the factual evidence regarding corruption. Now, when it comes to definitions, so the first problem is that the standard literature usually looks at corruption in two ways, um, which are basically the same thing. One, we define corruption as bribing public officials. Uh, the underlying assumption is that what they would do without corruption practices uh, would be perfect, basically. So anything which interferes with a perfect bureaucrat is necessarily bad. The second thing is that you, the bureaucrat can be, the second way to look at it is that the bureaucrat can be bad and therefore he uses uh, his own public office for private gains. Uh, once again, the basic notion is that you have a deal between a private agent and a public agent, um, whereby the public agent really breaks uh, the rules of the game by uh, money, which is accepted, and therefore the legal framework is being approached upon. Once again, the underlying assumption is that the underlying legal framework is more or less sufficient, optimal, wonderful, perfect, flawless, whatever. There are a number of problems with these definitions. Uh, I already mentioned one, that is the perfect perfection assumption behind it, and this is by no means guaranteed. Second thing is that uh, corruption is by no means exclusive to uh, the public sector. It's not restricted to the public sector. You can have surely interaction between the private and the public sector, which is what people usually look at, but you can also have corruption among private entities. Something we're not going to look at. We're not going to. <laughs> To, to analyze today uh, for the reason I'm going to tell you right uh, We can have corruption also among state officials. Now, uh, you don't really have only the state, you have various layers in the state system. You have bureaucrats, and various layers within the bureaucratic system, and you have politicians, and sometimes politicians are not the same time, the same thing as bureaucrats. And you can also have interactions, deals between politicians on one hand and the other person on the other hand. On the other hand. Uh, the reason why I'm not going to look into private-to-private uh, -private deals is that that's not a particularly problematic question. It is when uh, you have a manager in a private company, uh, a corrupt manager in a private company, what he's actually doing is breaking a contract between the shareholder and himself, and therefore it really comes forward. It's, it's not a big issue. And the market will take care of that. Is, I'm not saying that in the private world corruption is absent. What I'm saying is that if you overdo it, uh, a less corrupt company will drive you out of business, and therefore there is a limit to corruption. And the limit to corruption is going to be lower. Uh, the lower the normal the better exchange. So basically, competition will take care of corruption. So I'm not saying that corruption will be driven to zero, but saying that it will be kept within limits. When you have normative issues, then corruption will go sky high, obviously, because there are no uh, forces that spontaneously quote unquote 
would restrain him. So I'm leaving private to private stories aside. Uh, the other thing which uh, the standard definition has problems with is that it does not clarify the distinction between legality and legitimacy. That is, uh, there are situations where you have corrupt practices that are not classified as corrupt practices because they are combined with the law. That is, if you have the legislature passing the law, which is the outcome of corrupt practices, that doesn't show up in the statistics because, after all, what happens later is combined with the law. Um, that doesn't mean that you have legitimate practice, it just means that you have legal procedures. So, the standard definition doesn't make the distinction between legal and legitimate practices, which is a kind of a substantial story because corruption uh, really uh, includes both areas of, uh, of analysis. Um, the third or fourth uh, shortcoming of the standard definition is that uh, corruption excludes many sorts of legal practices that have different economic implications. It is, for instance, rent seeking is the main uh, issue at stake. And if you do not consider corruption at the same time as rent seeking, you get uh, what statisticians would call spurious correlation problems, and therefore your statistical results will be flawed. In my view, a better definition, which is seldom found in the literature, is looking at corruption as a result of a principal agent problem. That is, a situation where the agent breaks a contract with the principal by dealing with a third party. In particular, you have a situation where an agent receives a reward from a third party, and he receives that reward from dealing with a third party, and the deal is at least partly also the deal he has with the principal. So you just have one borderline case, which is nepotism. Of course, that is, what is the reward of nepotism, feminine ties, perhaps uh, long term uh, family solidarity? But that's really a minor story. And what I would like you to think about is the principal agent problem, because this is going to, this is what is going to drive you and drive us to um, the next 20 minutes or so. Um, so, uh, morality, the other story. Uh, I'm not going to look too much into legal aspects because uh, I'm not interested. It is uh, the legal aspect. If you know, if you have a principal agent contract, mm -hmm. and the legal aspect, which is legally valid, for instance, look at uh, what happens in uh, many regulatory issues. Uh, corruption is always there because you have a legal a rule which is legally. Um, be issued because parliament, government, uh, bureaucrats have the power to put a stand. So it's legal that whatever goes against the legal question and has uh, monetary transfers involved is going to be corruption. But that's not the point. Uh, the more relevant point from an analytical standpoint is the moral question. And of course, morality ultimately depends on our freedom. So, uh, the precariousness of the notion of freedom is a question of freedom from coercion. But if you are a mainstream uh, analyst, uh, you might have other notions of freedom in mind, say freedom to eat, freedom to contribute to the common good, freedom to comply with what government or parties or legislature claim. So, morality is a tricky issue there. Uh, what we would say is that if a principal agent contract is immoral, because, for instance, we never signed the Constitution, because we never went to vote, and therefore we never uh, gave our consent to any kind of social contract, then whatever the principal agent contract we have has no moral force, therefore there is no moral. Uh, so there is no, say, contract infringement or contract breakdown. Uh, 
what is more relevant? So this is end of the first part. The basic point of my first point is the basic point of the first part is that definitions are kind of fuzzy and hazy and bad for two reasons. A, they do not um, focus on the what is it, the, the notion of the moral content of the principal agent contract regarding uh, the state on the one hand, politicians and bureaucrats, bureaucrats and individuals, and B, uh, the uh, standard definition forgets about, uh, or really is marking the wrong tree because they make it a question of legality, and legality is an arbitrary notion. So corruption also becomes an arbitrary notion. So you go nowhere. Let's look at the figures. Uh, the standard literature looks at one set of figures only. That is, they have one aim. And the aim is to evaluate the consequences of corruption on GDP. It could be GDP levels most of the time. Sometimes they analyze GDP growth rates and they carry, on, they carry out more or less sophisticated metric exercises trying to find a correlation between corruption on the one hand, GDP uh, or GDP growth on the other hand. Unfortunately, other goals are totally ignored. And I'm going to ignore them too, but just for you to know what others, other goals could be, uh, you can have social goals, for instance, redistribution, even equality. Uh, people who might appreciate redistribution my think that redistribution through corruption is better than redistribution through other means. This is totally absent in the literature. Uh, political stability, political accountability, which I'm going to ignore, is equally ignored by the literature. The difference is that I thought I'm going to do it, and I apologize for that, the others don't. Um, basically, uh, you might have situations, central totalitarian countries, where you want to have uh, rights because otherwise you have no accountability uh, by bureaucrats at all levels. Therefore, you are willing to uh, exchange uh, rent seeking against tax or accountability, which does not rule out rent seeking by a much larger scale. So the standard literature claims that corruption is usually bad because it is illegal, which is some kind of definition, and because it is morally bad since it uh, reflects existence or creates dishonest agents, bureaucrats, but not only bureaucrats, as if bureaucrats without corruption were perfect, honest, clean, and uh, welfare loving people, or welfare other people's welfare. Uh, and without, uh, oops. Um, there are exceptions, accepted in the literature, and the exceptions are corruption is good or at least tolerable if it reduces transaction costs. That is, if it, if it is a way to circumvent bad laws and bad policy making. So the idea is that you have bad policy making, corruption is a way to reduce the cost of those bad laws, and therefore it can be acceptable. It is a second best solution, of course, in this case. Um, therefore, you have a wide range of statistical results. And this is, and this is, this I come to the very recent literature. And uh, you have basically, uh, it depends on the article you're looking at, uh, you have uh, people who carry out exercises and come out with the result that in low income countries uh, with little economic freedom, corruption is bad. The idea is that if you have economic, little economic freedom, the reward to corruption is low. Therefore, corruption absorbs scarce resources in activities that give you uh, very little benefits. I repeat, the idea is if you have Little economic freedom, you don't have many opportunities. That is, either you drink this bottle of water or we have no water. So, corrupting 
people in order to have this level of work does not improve the situation because you don't have you don't have a chance to choose among many bottles of water. Bottles of water. So corruption absorbs resources into an activity that does not open up the the, the, the spectrum, the range of the entrepreneurial uh, activities into which you might engage. So I repeat, when you have little economic freedom, you have a low income, and when you have little economic freedom, it means that you don't have opportunities to use, to allocate the resources in more effective ways, therefore corruption is just a dead weight loss. The alternative is that people say, no, uh, this is another range of statistical results needed from uh, literature. No, no, they say in low income countries, um, corruption is good because low income, the problem with low income countries is they have very bad low income. Therefore, if you carry out corrupt practices, you can avoid the consequences for the law. And therefore, you can do better things than what the law might force you to do. So the difference is that in one case, you define or you believe that low income is derived, is generated by little economic freedom. Uh, in the other case, you focus on the institutional context. Basically, you say we have a bad institutional context, and the uh, the, the contains is badly specified, unfortunately. It is, it is not quite the same. Economic, in this literature, economic freedom and bad institutional economy <coughs> is not the same thing. In one case, lack of economic freedom means lack of alternative. In the other context, um, bad institutional context means bad laws. So, depends on which issue you emphasize in your models, in your econometric uh, regressions, and you have different results. In one case, corruption is good, in the other case, corruption is bad. The opposite applies to high income countries. That is, in, uh, by corrupting officials, you have access to superior to better allocation of resources, <laughs> then corruption is good. If by corrupting officials you misallocate resources, uh, then corruption is bad. In general, uh, that is just in general, it is assumed that in developed countries corruption is bad because the idea is if the country is developed, it means that low making is good. Therefore, all attempts to interfere with common, current legal context are going to affect efficiency. Therefore, it's going to be bad. The minority of the authors, they claim that it can be good because. In uh, high developed countries, you have a lot of economic freedom, which means that you have uh, a wide range of alternatives. Therefore, by going through corruption, you open up this latent range of alternatives, which you can exploit in your entrepreneurial engagements. So, once again, there is an ambiguity in the definitions, and as a result, you have an ambiguity in the results. If you look at the last issue, the last one is yes. well, in Peter German, you have two articles on corruption, one next to the other, and then have uh, opposite results. And they both come up at the end of very complex econometric estimates. But the main difference between them is that they look at corruption by emphasizing um, two different notions of corruption and two different institutional contexts. In fact, the problem is that you have to decide, you have to make up your mind whether you're emphasizing the rent seeking component in the corruption phenomenon or the law enforcement components. If you emphasize the rent seeking story, that is, when the principal agent contract I have referred to is about rent seeking, then corruption might reduce expensive rent seeking and replace it with cheaper rents. If that is the case, then corruption is good. So I repeat, suppose that we are starting from a situation where rent seeking is pervasive. And rent seeking is big scale rent seeking. Then corruption 
is a way to reduce those rents by having more efficient entrants driving out of the market, less efficient risk. If that is the case, then the amount of rent seeking in the economy drops, and therefore, environment improves, and therefore, you can have better results in terms of GDP. However, when the principal agent contract is about efficiency, that is, you don't have, you believe that you don't have rent seeking, or you believe that you originally have a low level of rent seeking, then corruption is low. So, because you introduce extra costs and, and start raising the opportunities acquired for the corruption. So, the basic issue is that you have to tell me before how much rent seeking you start from. And as a consequence of your rent seeking environment, before the corruption exercise takes place, then I tell you the results of our corruption. The other uh, possibility is uh, uh, um, the other possibility is to look at the law enforcement component. And the idea is that if law enforcement is bad, the agent can, can't perform, then the enforcers actually be right. In this case, corruption enhances to improve the rule of law, rule of law, means property right protection, important contract enforcement. In that case, corruption can be beneficial. If the principal agent contract is loosely defined, uh, once again, corruption defines the rules of the game that the legislature has not defined, and therefore it gives reference points to operators, and therefore corruption is good. If the principal agent contract is well specified and law enforcement is an issue, then corruption is again bad because it alters the original contract. Once again, tell me what your assumptions regarding the law enforcement are, and I'll tell you whether corruption can be beneficial or uh, not. So basically, the confusion in the current literature, in my view, is due to the confusion on uh, the notion of corruption, because they put together these two notions one emphasizing rent seeking, the other emphasizing law enforcement, and then uh, depending upon which side you want to investigate, you can have different results. The fact that you call the two phenomena into a little bit the same way, of course, adds to the, to the confusion. Uh, I suggest a different way to look at the whole issue by trying to take into account this renting story. And uh, my suggestion is to define corruption in two different stages. You can call it first degree corruption and second degree corruption. You can have first degree, you can have first degree corruption when uh, the legislation, that is the political body, is involved. That is, you can have on the one hand top politicians and bureaucrats, on the other hand you can have other top politicians and bureaucrats or companies or interest groups. Uh, basically, this is legal corruption because you just ask the politicians to do something legally, uh, that is to give you grants. But it is legal because, after all, it goes to requirement. Uh, you don't have to pay these guys instantly, you just have to make sure that they get the votes, and you don't have necessarily to pay them to uh, persuade them that by doing A rather than B, they're going to give them extensions. Then you have second degree corruption, which is uh, when a smaller scale corruption is involved, it is minor player. players um, are in the game. And minor players means, say, small companies, individuals, low rank bureaucrats. Now, let's look, let's take advantage of this distinction first degree and second degree corruption. Let's see how the rent story works from this perspective. Um, if you focus on rent seeking, which is carried through, carried out through legislation, first example, and the, by far the most important example is probably regulation. Uh, first degree corruption, that is illegal corruption, is usually bad. As we know, regulation is bad. Even in a dynamic context, it does not include things. Because if you have a corrupt, that is regulated industry, and you have 
companies that are willing to pay a lot in order to get into the industry and change regulation, uh, you do that only if you are able to increase the rents to the bureaucrats and to the politicians. So the overall debt by loss is going to increase. There are two important exceptions, though, which are very frequent. One is strategic regulation. That is, if you are a politician, you're not interested in getting the bribe right now. What you're interested in to begin with is to create a market for bribes. So you don't really care whether you regulate industry A or it's B. What you care for is to regulate something so that somebody would come up to you and offer you a bribe to do something different. Either to increase regulation, to decrease the regulation. Uh, if you decrease regulation, that, that doesn't make you honest, it just gives you a possibility of being for free market where you can run. But that is not a sense in course. Now, when you have strategic regulation, uh, you set up barriers in order to create ranks and opportunities and, uh, rather than create ranks. Uh, in that case, property is good, of course, because uh, look at the uh, developing country. Suppose that I am the totalitarian leader of country and I decide to ban all kinds of foreign investments. Am I going to be Not stage one. But the day afterwards, somebody will come up to me and say, How much do you want in order to let me in? I can tell you my price. You come in. Is it good or bad for the country? Of course it's good. Because you have one more company operating in the country. And part of the profits have been taken away from the company and they go to the leader of the company, leader of country A. But overall, growth rate increases, or GDP increases, welfare of the population, whatever you want, goes up. Uh, so in this case, when you have strategic regulation to begin with, corruption comes in, then you have corruption induced by the strategic regulation. This is good. It does not appear in the statistics. It is what appears as if it's a company that bribes me. That you don't have my legally corrupt practices that have been enforced when I begin with my regulatory policy to begin with. So if you look at the current statistical exercises, you have biased samples because you just see one side of the picture. And if you look at just one side of the picture without taking out, taking to account the other side of the picture, you forget about the notion of opportunity cost. And therefore, you don't know what the net result is going to be. You just see the cost of the developments. Um, another possibility of beneficial corruption, uh, in the first degree, is when you have large differences in productivity between the incumbent rent seekers and the rivals. Um, which again, I can repeat my example with slightly different words and cut the same thing. It's good if a good competitor comes in and gets out when the good rent seeker and efficient rent seeker is usually better than an inefficient rent seeker. Uh, the reason is that you can pay a higher price so it gets in, but still creates more wealth than the inefficient incumbent rent seeker. In this framework, second degree corruption is good if it mitigates the effects of large scale rent seeking. It is uh, first degree corruption. Once again, the statistics concentrate, uh, concentrate on second degree rent seeking and forget about first degree rent seeking. So, of course, if you take first, second degree rent seeking on its own, small scale bribes, you say it's bad. But if you don't compare it, with the benefit, which is reducing the cost of first degree rent seeking, then if you do that, it is really comparing it, the net outcome is much less obvious and it can actually be positive. Similar comments apply to uh, law enforcement poorly defined laws. So I just uh, read it up to conclude. Uh, mainstream economics got interested. Uh, into corruption in the 1990s. Basically, because the World Bank and the IMF had found out that their development policies were in total disaster, and therefore they started to think that the usual development policies 
had to do, had to be revised in the light of institutional economics. Their understanding of institutional economics was let's design perfect institutions. And the reason why we don't have successful development policies is that institutions, agency, regulators are not perfect enough. So they say one way to make them perfect is to eradicate corruption. They ran the statistics, and what did they see? They see the office or the office. That is, whenever you have um, bad policy making and lack of economic freedom, you name it, then economic performance is disappointed. Uh, in particular, they show that corruption uh, affects investment and investment affects growth. And of course, that is theoretically weak and factually false. Uh, the reason being that corruption does not necessarily discourage investments. If you are a small entrepreneur, uh, if you have to comply with all the regulations in place, say, in Italy or in other um, industrialized countries, uh, if you have to comply, you will never invest again. If you pay a few bribes here or there, he makes it, he makes it worthwhile to invest. So again, you're doing this rather than taking your money away or just spending it all. That's option. So factually, these were bad results. Uh, theoretically, when we're talking about it, it doesn't make much sense either. Um, my suggestion is that we have to, corruption is a much more articulated phenomenon, it's much more complicated. We have to look at what causes corruption, and I'll give you two uh, ways to look at it. One is by comparing the brain seeking story with the law enforcement story. The other key is by comparing first degree corruption with second degree corruption. And if you look at Corruption by using one of these two keys, you see that corruption not only is a much more complex story, uh, not only has it um, much more, uh, much wider moral implication, but it can also have quite different.